Okay, so there's a lot that I talk about. I'm not much of a structured speaker, no slides or anything. I freestyle. But there's so much to discuss. I want to discuss what the sister from the African Union brought up, because that's something our company has been working on. Um, I have several representatives, uh, family owned. Uh, Messiah, set it up right here, please. This is my middle son, Messiah. I, he's uh, actually an integral part of the company. I have my youngest child, Mariama. My oldest couldn't make it here. I have my director of operations, Eleanor Reed, business development. <laughs> Lorna Johnson, um, we are a minority-owned firm, and uh, our firm has a lot of talent. Uh, Eleanor is ex-McKinsey, ex-Goldman. Uh, Lorna is currently the assistant treasurer to the DNC and the honorary counsel to Jamaica from LA as well. Okay, and I'm just me. So we have about 22 members all around the world, Asia, uh, Europe, and America and we're doing a lot in Africa. So I want to go through Africa, but before that, I want to lay a groundwork on what we're doing. Okay? Um, where is Messiah? Oh, is it recording? Okay, so I always record myself. So I want to lay a groundwork of what we're doing. <clears throat> I want to discuss power, or socioeconomic status, but that's a fancy word for power. So a lot of audience participation. Does anybody know what power is? If I raise my hand, what is it? Say the organize people and or money. Is that a general agreement? It's the ability to influence somebody. Influence something? Any others? Right quick, before I move on. The audience generally agrees with money. Money? Is money, is that it? Okay. So from my perspective and from a social, a scientific perspective, power is a, tr quad a triangle where you have ownership of financial capital and assets, right? Not necessarily at the top, that's one third. You have ownership of political influence. And then you have ownership of social influence. Without all three, you don't have power. Okay, a lot of us, and I'm a Howard grad, by the way, um, 1989, 2000 Howard grad. A lot of us believe that in order to gain power, you need money, and if you have money, you've attained power. But that just doesn't work. Lil Wayne probably has more money than Barack Obama. Who has more power on the world stage? Okay, and the reason is because he has all three portions of that triangle covered. Okay, so my goal in creating Veritasium and enabling peer-to-peer -peer capital markets, which is what we do, is to enable power to, or enable access to power to those who don't have it. Now, peer-to-peer -peer capital markets means Peter could do business directly with Paul, and Paul could do business directly with Paulette without using a third-party intermediary, like a bank or broker or exchange, okay? Uh, this system we're developing using software. The software is like Windows for the blockchain, where you go in, you have a cell phone, a tablet, a computer, you can see into the blockchain, and then you can interact with it, and you can do deals. You do deals using smart contracts. Smart contracts are a social agreement, or uh, like a legal agreement or a social agreement, but it's constant computer code running through the blockchain. What makes it special is these contracts can't be broken, they can't be breached, and they can hold capital, which means they can control the entire deal. Now you have an agreement that can't be broken or breached, that executes automatically, and that can control the dissemination of money, and you could do business with anybody all over the world and never have to trust them. I could do business with you, brother, and doesn't matter what your credit score is, I don't care what your balance sheet looks like, you can't break out of the deal. So this is very, very special, okay? The ability to control and own this gives you not only that financial asset control, but also the social asset and a significant portion of the political um, assets, which means you have almost all three portions of that triangle. So whoever controls Right, the businesses and business models built on top of the blockchain has power. Every paradigm shift, uh, paradigm shift is when new technology comes in and wipes the old technology out. Every time, par every paradigm shift that comes along takes the old guard, flushes them away, and brings in the new guard. We have paradigm shifts starting with uh, the invention of the wheel, and then fire, and that was maybe a thousand years apart. After that, you had things such as uh, uh, 
uh, the combust lights, electricity, the combustion engine, the integrated circuit, etc. During each paradigm shift, the time, the space between each paradigm shift got shorter and shorter. From thousands of years, to a thousand years, to hundreds of years, to several decades, and then you went from the IC chip to the Mac, to the computer, to the mini computer, which he has in his hand, to the microcomputer, to the internet, which is just, what, 1993, and now we have the blockchain. But the problem is, every paradigm shift, you have people who don't understand it. When they don't understand it, they poo-poo it. It's a scam, it has no inherent value, like the brother said, with Bitcoin, and it's not to knock him, okay, it's a misunderstanding. But misunderstanding something is very different from trying to push it to the wayside. Because as you misunderstand it, those who do understand it capture it, own it, and they become part of the power structure, and they exclude you. Very, very important lesson. So we're doing a lot of things at Veritasium. If you go to veritasium.com, um, you see our introductory video. You know, it's an international firm. Um, we've been in Dubai, all throughout Europe, Amsterdam, London. Uh, we've been about five different African nations. I'm incorporating, I'm pushing things through Nigeria, through Kenya, Uganda, Ghana, potentially South Africa. Um, and we're moving very, very hard. One thing we're doing is we're creating what I call a pan-African economic token. So we're creating a unit of account, something like a currency that runs through the blockchain, accessible through your cell phone, through a tablet, through a computer, and you can use it to transfer value. This value is backed by um, a resource where that's the most plentiful in Africa. What is the most plentiful and one of the most valuable resources in Africa over the last, say, 10,000 years? Take a guess. People, you know something? That's probably right, okay? Non-organic asset. What is it? Let me help you out, hold on. This is a kilogram brick of stuff that's found primarily from the African continent. Kilogram is about 2.2 pounds. But so I come, I'm gonna have someone escort this around so you can see it for obvious reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Mariama, stand up please. Now, using this technology, right, to send this value around, the Pan-African Economic Token, right, anybody could do it. How old are you, Mariama? Speak up loud. 12. Uh, come here, Mariama. Come here. Come up front. Mariama calculated the value, right, of all the units I'm about to show everybody. She did it on her cell phone. It took her about five or ten minutes as she was waiting. She's 12 years old. Pass that around. Let everybody touch it and feel it. Please don't drop it, okay? How much is one kilogram of gold right now? 39,100, wait, $39,147.90. So, you see how heavy it is, right? Most people have never transferred that. Right now, you could go to our website, you could go to the web page, you can purchase tokens, right? Purchase that amount of gold, and then you could send it to anybody all around the world in seconds, okay? That gold is stored in vaults in the US, two places in the US, also in Zurich, Switzerland, and in Singapore, okay? Now, that gold is sourced out of Africa. Now, we have different denominations. Go and show that to everybody very carefully, okay? And each denomination, from grams to 100 gram um, bricks to one ounce bricks, can be sent through the blockchain using this token. Okay, follow it, Mariama. Follow it. <laughs> <laughs> now, why did we use gold? Well, gold has lasting value. For the last 2,000 years, gold has been pretty much the same value. So you don't buy gold to invest and they think it's going to go up. You buy gold to make sure that anything else that goes down doesn't hurt you. 100 years ago, one gram of gold bought about three or four loaves of bread. Okay, I'm sorry. 1,000 years ago, one gram of gold bought about three or four loaves of bread. 100 years ago, five cents bought one loaf of bread. Now, I haven't been in D.C. for a while, but I think a loaf of bread is about three or four dollars. Four loaves of bread would be about $50. So from five cents for one loaf to $50 for four loaves. Significant inflation. Gold has held its um, par for 1,000 years. The dollar has slipped 50 times, 100 times in just 100 years. So 
If you take this steady store value, as an electronic token, and you bring it back to where it came from, the 54 nations that make up Africa, you can unite all the African nations under one, basically one currency. I don't call it a currency because of regulatory reasons, but one store of value. So what happens if we unite 54 nations in Africa under one economic token? Take a guess. Wakanda? Well, I'll tell you what. Let's go a little history. We're going to go back to a little history. In the WTO, when the Asian, the big Asian nations first entered the WTO, the World Trade Organization, you had Japan that entered. Japan had a vibrant economy up and coming, okay? Roughly about $500 billion worth of uh, economic activity, which is a lot. But Japan is a small island. You had China, which entered the world stage. You had Korea, South Korea, which entered the world stage. South Korea, had, um, didn't have as big a splash either, but it made a big difference. South Korea has a vibrant economy, so does Japan. China, who had a less vibrant economy than both South Korea and China um, and Japan, entered the world stage with a slower economy. But they entered this world stage with 1.1 billion people. 1.1 billion people. That means that over time, China's economy caught on fire. China is a world superpower right now. It was a third world nation. 20 years ago, and that's what happens when you bring that many people onto a world stage. China was able to do it because China has one overarching government, one overarching economic union, okay, by force often, after the British decolonized, and that made China the biggest economic threat to, I wouldn't say threat, challenger, right, to the US and Europe right now. 1.1 billion people on the WTO, how many people are in Africa right now? 1.27 billion people, right? That's right. I have 1.25, let's say one and a quarter. 1.27 billion people. That means that if Africa comes on the world stage as an economic union, that means they're coming in stronger than China. The biggest difference between a pan-African economic union and a Chinese economic union is? Resources. All that gold in that bag, it's about $50,000 worth, 99% of it came from Africa. Most of the oil source comes from the African continent. Diamonds, African continent. Silver, palladium, palladium, um, platinum, rhodium, bauxite, aluminum. Africa is by far the richest continent in the world. It's also the poorest continent. Think about it. The richest continent is the poorest. The reason is colonialization, extracting value out of Africa without Africans taking advantage of it. So if you bring a unified Pan-African token to the African continent, unify all 54 nations or just some of them, a lot of them act as one, you have the United States of Africa. Europe tried that, the EU, right? World War I stemmed from populism when too many people, wealth congregated in one portion, a lot of poor people, you had a lot of uh, um, charismatic leaders who said, I can free you. You had conflict, you had war. World War II, the same thing, through Hitler. Europe knew it was gonna survive a World War III. So they decided that they want to emulate the most successful nation in the world at that time, which was the United States. So they wanted to unify all the European nations. I think roughly 17 or so, 17 to 23. That was the beginning of the EU, okay, European Union. But they messed up because they tried to take a shortcut, right? The United States had 450 years of free African labor. They had a natural barrier, east and west, the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. They spoke one language, they're one contiguous um, land mass, and they basically had one culture, right? Except for the approaches where they colonized, but we're not gonna get into that. Despite all that, we still had a civil war that wiped out 10% of the male population, and it still took us about 500 years. 600 years. The EU wanted to do it without war, without 450 years of free labor, by speaking 17 different languages, 17 different laws, 17 different economies, 17 different nations, and they wanted to do it in 30 years, which is why the EU is now falling apart and the Euro is a failed experiment. So if the EU couldn't do it, why, do, why does a young brother from New York feel he can do it? Because the power of the blockchain allows you to program this token, and I don't have to force Zimbabwe to, mo to mash itself into the economy of Nigeria to succeed. I don't have to force Nigeria to keep pace with South Africa. 
I have one token backed by one store of value, and it can be programmed to match each and every economy at will as it passes through. Now think about how powerful the concept of uniting an African continent is. You have the United States of America, you have the European Union, you have the Pan-African nation, United States of Africa. On, under the Pan-African nation, you have the largest store of natural resources on the entire planet. Now, does that sound like a big thing, or is it my imagination? Amazing, Amazing? that's it? Okay. So, how feasible is it? Well, we've already started talking to nations in Africa. Okay, we have deals signed in Kenya. We're working on deals in Nigeria, and big boys in Nigeria, very, very big boys. Um, multi-billionaires. We have deals signed in financial institutions along West Africa. We're working on East Africa. We're trying to do the same. We also have deals done in the Caribbean. So we've incorporated in um, areas in Caribbean. I guess I could say it out loud now, it's not a secret. We just incorporated in Bermuda, which has its own digital assets legislation. We're doing a broker dealer, right, in the United States under FINRA, 100% blockchain based. Everything is 100% blockchain based. So we're moving around the world. I can fail in Africa and be a wild success. So, any questions before I move on? Okay, I have a very quick question. So um, it seems to me like your cryptocurrency is solely backed on gold. Am I correct? No, so we don't do cryptocurrency. We do applications that are right on top of the blockchain. So we solve problems, okay? I gave you one example. Here's a brochure. By the way, just go to veritasium.com. It explains everything. But here's a brochure that explains the software that allows assets to back the currency. So we have software that's uh, smart contract driven hedge fund, private equity fund. We have a smart contract driven device that allows you to back a currency with an asset. One of those happens to be gold. Okay. So that's a subset of what we do. Go ahead. All right, no, perfect. Then you answered my question. Okay. Yeah, actually you have to find I go where you tell me to go. Yeah. Yeah. Give me a whole, a whole question. So when you say centralized, what do you mean? So if you're, if you're producing the um, software, where they can tokenize their commodity or their resources. Is, that, is it still operating on a centralized or a decentralized, the token, that, the token that they're producing? You're saying it. So I'm going to try and answer the question for you, but you have to come up with a full question. Our company. Full question. Huh? Well, I don't <laughs> understand the question. Let's put it that way. Our company is a for profit company. It's centralized, um, it's irrelevant. The asset ownership is decentralized. The assets are yours. You get the token, it's in your wallet. You do what you want with it. As a matter of fact, it's not decentralized. I stand, my, I stand to correct myself. It's fully distributed. Decentralization is something that runs on a spectrum. And whenever you're dealing with economic assets, decentralization is going to be a negative event. Things are always going to centralize once it comes to money because you're going to have people who are more powerful, more driven, more dedicated, that can cheat, etc. If you go for full distribution, right, when everybody has something, that would be nirvana. Okay, because then you have full control of your assets. We call this autonomy or autonomous to be able to act on your own. Next question. All right, thank you very much. So does your software, is it actually being utilized right now with anybody, with any assets? Well, we, it's utilized with gold, right? We just launched it, it's going through a beta. You could go to Fork Delta, Ether Delta, two or three other exchanges. You could see the gold tokens be traded back and forth with each other. You could go buy the gold tokens right now. Go to veritation.com, right? Go to VE Assets, click one of the gold assets, and click Buy. You could buy it. You could buy it with Bitcoin, Ethereum, or US dollar wire. Once you buy it, it's yours. You can do whatever you want with it. You have to go through AML KYC, and the reason is I go to jail if you don't, okay? Once you AML KYC, you purchase it, it's autonomous, it's sovereign. You're your own bank, you do whatever you want with it. You can sell it to somebody, pledge it, give it away, lose it, et cetera. But what makes this special, and I forgot the most important part, right? It's fully redeemable. So you buy a kilogram of gold, 
You sell it to this man, this man sells it to that man, that man sells it to that woman, she redeems it, she sends the token back to us, AML, KYC, so you're not a terrorist, we ship the gold to you. So it's physical ownership of gold in the form of a token, fully insured by Lords of London, um, secured by Brinks, and it's an LBMA and COMEX approved vault. So you actually have physical ownership, but you can send it through your cell phone. That's very special because now you have a stable token, right? If I purchase this token and it runs on Ethereum blockchain, you see Ethereum has dropped like 80% in the last couple of months. All the altcoins have dropped in unison because of high correlation. This has actually went up 85% against Ethereum. Um, anybody could go and download it. Anybody who's with me, show them what the uh, coin looks like, measured it in F. You can see it's went up. It will never go down with Ethereum because if it does, if I sold it to him, right, and it dropped 50% with Ethereum, if he was smart, he would simply send the token back to me and redeem it. He just bought gold for 50 cents on a dollar. Okay, so now the rest of the world says, well, I could buy gold for 50 cents on a dollar too, and they buy the token up, and it goes up to what? The spot price of gold. If it goes too far above the spot price of gold, people sell the token, get the gold, and they keep the difference. So that's called market arbitrage. She has a question over there. That's called market arbitrage. Market arbitrage keeps the value of the token right about the price of gold. And whenever it breaks the price of gold, greed causes people to do something about it. And it's always going to stay stable. No fancy algorithms, no computer programming, old fashioned human nature, greed, market arbitrage is what keeps it stable. It's the only stable token that I know of that rides on the Ethereum blockchain. And it's the only one that's guaranteed to be stable. If it ever destabilizes, somebody gets rich. It'll probably be me because I will always buy it for underprices. <laughs> Reggie Milton, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, brothers and sisters.